And here we're going to start with <coughs> Susan Amstrad. Hardly rumpled as I held you, my cheek pressed against your own. My breath splintered into shards of fear, while yours was calm, though faint. Calm and faint and fainter still. The pause between each shallow breath grew longer than the breath itself, until you had no breath at all. For me, your death was a cataclysm, a tsunami. Yet the moment you slipped from life was so still, so tranquil, I never would have noticed if I hadn't been holding you, my cheek pressed against your own. Susan's uh, bio, and I'll do that now. Um, wait a second. Find it. There's a lot of people in this magazine. Uh, uh, Susan Amsterdam has been coordinator of the Theater and Poetry Project at Passaic County Community College for over 20 years, and she's a former English teacher and journalist. Her poems and essays have appeared in Lips, The Sun, and Elsewhere. So uh, let's give Susan another round of applause. Uh, our next uh, reader is Susan Lembo Bailick, and Susan is the Associate Director of Cultural Affairs at Passaic County Community College in Patterson. She's an animal rights and environmental activist. Her poems have also appeared in Lips, Paddlefish, Tiferet, and Metal Meadowlands Muse. Her first book of poetry, Sinatra, the Jeeperettes, and Me was just published by Garden Oak Press, and it's a wonderful book. You must get it if you have a chance. Susan Lembo Bailey. They met at a dance at the armory on Market Street, where my dad asked his friend, who's that girl? It's one of my girlfriends, Amelia, he said. Later, my dad asked her to dance, but her dance card was full, so she told him he'd have to wait until next time. The next week, he saw her at St. Michael's Church, and they danced the Lindy, the Foxtrot, the Peabody, sometimes the Waltz. She was 17, a senior in high school. He was 19. They took buses to the rest of cabin in Inglewood Cliffs, and danced to Frank Sinatra when he was in the Tommy Dorsey band. And they went to dances in churches and halls all over Patterson for 35 cents. Afterwards, they'd stop for, for, at Libby's for hot dogs, and my dad would walk my mom home to Patterson Ave, then walk back to the golf course in Paramus, where he catted in exchange for rent. My dad won my mom over, my grandma too, He's a good boy, such a hard worker, she'd say, and she'd feed him homemade pasta and meatballs and warm bread. Though my mom told her not to be too nice to him. It's not like I'm going to marry him, she'd say. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, our 
Our next uh, poet is Stanley Barkin, and Stanley H. Barkin is editor, publisher of Cross Cultural Communications, which celebrated its 40th anniversary with 400 titles in 50 different languages in 2011. His own work has been published in 15 collections, several bilingual, but Bulgarian, Italian, Polish, Russian, Sicilian. The latest is Raisins and Al with Almonds, um, translated to Sicilian by Marco Scalabrini. Um, and the poems in this issue are from a second family collection in progress. Oh, I'm going to say this wrong. Mishpuka. More Mishpuka. <laughs> OK, I did it. I did it. Hey, but also I have to say about Stanley, I'm not going to say extra things about other people, but Stanley <laughs> deserves extra things because he's been laboring in the fields of poetry for 40 years. He is one of the most generous, people I know. He's always trying to bring people from different cultures together to set up readings for other people, to get festivals going in other countries, to bring writers from other cultures here. He's worked so hard, and his wife Bibi is here too. Bibi's a wonderful artist, an amazing artist, and she has supported him in this effort, which must at some times have seemed like uh, she was Sisyphus or something but ah. <laughs> behind him. <laughs> but she has always supported him in this, and I think she deserves a round of applause too. But let's <laughs> let's give a special round of applause to Stanley, who understands that nothing gets done, whether it's in the labor movement or in social justice or in poetry, without people giving a lot of themselves without expecting anything to re in return. And that's Stanley Barkin. It's always a privilege to be here and with Maria, uh, with these large encomiums. And as for my wife, she complains all the way, but she says aggravation agrees with her. <laughs> I'm going to read a poem, just a poem that was written during Sandy about my two grandchildren, granddaughters. Um, that's going into Mishbucha too. There was Mishbucha one. It wasn't called one, it was just Mishbucha, meaning family. The Art of War and Peace. The Art of War for Roxy. Dusk. Darkness descends on the hurricane caused lighthouse, lightless house. In the oversized chair in the corner of the living room, my barely three-foot, three-year-old granddaughter is reading Sun Tzu's The Art of War. Well, she's curled up with a book, riffling the pages, appears to be reading it. Given that she's emerged whole, unblemished from a wrestling match with a bigger, older, eight-year-old sister, it seems she has a plan how to get even. The first book she'll write when she's older. Just you wait. <laughs> War and Peace for Tasha. Now my eight-year-old, in response to her younger sister's reading Sun Tzu's The Art of War, takes out her copy of Tolstoy's War and Peace, <laughs> which she's been reading since the age of five, just a dozen or so pages each year. It's a thousand pages in the paperback edition and even longer in hardcover, but she's game, though she's having a hard time with some of the names. <laughs> One day, when she's able to finish all of it and her sister finishes The Art of War, they just may find how to make peace out of the childish war between them. Thank you. I'm sure that hit the TV really well. Um, the next reader is Laura Boss, and uh, Laura is the first place, place winner of PSA's Gordon, Gordon Barber Poetry Contest, founder and editor of Lips Magazine. She is the recipient of three New Jersey State Council on the Arts Poetry Fellowships, and in June 2011, received the first International Poetry Award at the International Poetry Festival at Swansea, Wales. Her books include Reports from the Front, Arms, New and Selected Poems, and Flashlight. 
She recently co-edited with John Gallagher, Time is a Toy, Selected Poems of Michael, ben of Michael Benedict. Her poems have appeared in the New York Times, among other um, journals. Uh, let's welcome Laura Boss. I'm very grateful to Maria for doing all the work she has been doing. I remember when she sat behind a little desk in the library and um, what she has done. I, I've always said if Maria were in business, she'd be CEO of IBM. But that's that's. I, but she's such a great person and such a kind person. And so thank you for publishing me. And um, I see so many of my friends out here. Thank you. It's great to be reading with you. Um, my home where I live alone. My home where I live alone needs, according to the new man I met, the wooden floors restained and polished. My home where I live alone needs, according to this man, a painting, and I should change the champagne color to stark white, which he says will be more attractive. My home where I live alone, he says, needs new furniture, and he'll go with me to choose it, although it's understood I will be paying. And it doesn't have to be, he says, high end, but a place like Raymore and Flanagan. My home where I live alone needs to be redone, or he won't come to my apartment to see me, he tells me. It has a musty smell from the hall closet. I don't tell him that's where my now dead lover's papers and poems are stored, so my old lover's hated heirs and cousins who said they planned to dump his papers and archives in the dumpster in the basement of his New York apartment where I sometimes lived with him for 23 years, and I begged to be given those books and papers, and now, although they add... They now add this musty smell to my closets and bookshelves. Still, I am so glad to have them in this apartment where I live alone rather than in some garbage dump decaying and turning to mulch. It makes him too sad to see me living like this, this new man in my life tells me at his first visit to my home where I live alone. It would be different, he adds, if I couldn't afford it. I don't want to tell him I can't afford it. That whatever money I make as a freelance poet from readings and workshops barely covers my rent at this apartment. I don't think this guy who drives a Toyota most days but has a Porsche Carrara in his own garage that he takes out for Sunday drives and to friends where he can park it safely in their driveways and sometimes shows off to prospective girlfriends. I hope this guy won't look under my bed where boxes of old poems are stored and where there are probably dust motes. He's already complained about the moldy smell coming from the books of my lover, books given to me when he died. This new man says that the view of the New York skyline and Hudson River below in my home where I live alone is spectacular, but I need to get my windows washed. I know he's right. I know he's right, but can't afford the window washer, though I don't say anything to this new man, but thank you. <laughs> Our next reader is Amanda J. Bradley, and um, just a minute. Uh, she has two books of poems out from New York Quarterly, books Oz at Night and Hints and Allegations. Amanda is a graduate of the MFA, MFA program at the New School, and she holds a PhD in English and American Literature from Washington University in St. Louis. She is assistant professor at Keystone College in Pennsylvania. Uh, let's welcome Amanda J. Bradley. This is uh, one of the longer poems I've ever written, so just a warning. It's uh, in three parts. It's called, I Read People by What They Read. In those early lazy days of college, when we felt we were so busy with schoolwork, and sat in that wood-walled cafe with a Proust reference in its name, La Madeleine, sex coursing our veins, jealousy and confusion, and a mad insistence on independence driving our conversations. You mentioned you like Jean-Jacques Rousseau. In a snap, I knew you prized individuality above most elf. You wanted to explore cities and people, sure, but you wanted the world to feel who you are. 
It was flattering I was important to you because you were important to yourself. And I felt like a wild dervish at the time, careening in chaotic circles. I did not manage to stay in one piece. I whirled myself straight into the psych ward. I was beside myself. Eventually there would be an online and I would find you there and see that you lived in Paris with a painter. I was not surprised. Years later we would sit at either end of a table in New York City and discuss what we were reading and all the other things people discuss. It would slowly become apparent that we were halfway through our lives now, that we had known each other more years than we had not. Maybe I'm okay with being tied this way. Maybe you are too. Section two. In those initial spark-filled conversations in a brick-walled coffee shop in Binghamton, before I knew we were upstate New York, because I lived in Chicago where everything was downstate Illinois, <laughs> you mentioned you like Herman Hess. In a snap, I knew you were on a spiritual quest. You wanted sex and thick black coffee and a cheese Danish, sure, but you wanted enlightenment too. It was flattering you believed I can contribute to that quest. I could offer something meaningful because I felt like a bag of broken bones at the time. I wasn't sure how I managed to walk around and utter words. How am I doing this, I wondered. I was beside myself. Eventually, I would visit you in New York City and see your bookshelves. Dao Te Ching, eight versions of the Bible, the Zohar, the Quran. I was not surprised. Years later, we would sit at either end of our Brooklyn apartment, and we would both stumble across the fact that the Gospel of Judas had been found and was being sold mass release. We would tell each other about it over dinner, and we would take turns reading our hardback copy. Maybe we are meant to be tied this way. Maybe we are. Section three. My favorite novels are Crime and Punishment, Jane Eyre. I have my reasons, because I like ominous, unconventional men like Raskolnikov in all his despicability, and Rochester with his dark power plays. I like men who brood and don't want to breed. <laughs> Hamlet, of course. I pick Shelley over Wordsworth. I pick Marvell over Milton. I pick Stevens over Williams. I pick Marvell over Milton. I like poetry that makes me think. That's sexy poetry to me. I enjoy a good joke, but not enough to pick Kenneth Koch over John Berryman. Does that tell you something about me? Perhaps in a snap, you know I take myself too seriously. I take life too seriously. Perhaps you know I am too fascinated by the opposite sex and they have taken too much of my time. Perhaps I wish I felt like a more consistent feminist. After all these years of really high highs and really low lows, maybe I'm okay with being too serious in my poems. It's safe in here. In here I can pick Dickinson and Zimborska over the whole lot of our long dark history, and I do. In here, I can sense the world's vibrations pulsing in time with my frontal lobe. The possibility is endless. <sighs> Excuse me. <laughs> I can get to the bottom of the meaning of life, of this life, of your life, our lives. I am a limited, omniscient narrator. I am full of melodramatic weeping. I am a wild winter wind sweeping snow through stubborn pines. I am the one who recognizes the rhymes. I am the one who makes them. I am the one, and oh, my hatred is fierce. Um, and I'll say, Amanda, if she doesn't mind my saying so, is married to uh, Raymond Hammond, who edits New York Quarterly Press, and who's a wonderful, also a wonderful worker in the fields of literature. Um, the next reader is Carly De Silva. Uh, from Watchung, New Jersey. I don't have her bio here because she actually is one of the poets under uh, 40 uh, who, who was, whose work was chosen for the Poets Under 40 anthology. And she's going to read that poem, uh, which will be in the next issue. Thank you very much. Maria for urging me to stay and read this. Um, I'm honored to be able to read here to and with all of you, so thank you. It's really been wonderful. Um, I'll just jump right in. A sonnet about Richard Gere. <laughs> Richard Gere asked me to go on a date with him. 
I took his arm, and we went out for brunch. I ordered crepes. He eggs. We talked about how he looked 24 years ago, how he liked his hair. Richard Gere wore glasses on the date and spilled his drink on his lap. I called for the waiter. He ran, Richard Gere, I mean, to the bathroom, came back with toilet paper on his shoe. And he laughed more than I expected him to laugh. And he smelled weird, old, like a used towel. I couldn't get too close. I think I like him better when he makes himself up, when I can make him up. He isn't real. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, now I need to know whether um, Katie D'Angelo from Maryland is here. Is she? No, I thought, I thought it would be improbable that she would come all the way from Maryland. Um, Gil Fagiani is from Long Island City, New York, and um, he's our next reader. And his most recent public, published collection of poetry is Surfs of Psychiatry. He is uh, translated into English, poetry written in Italian and Abruzzese dialect. Gil co-curates the Italian-American Writers Association monthly readings in Manhattan. Let's welcome Gil Fagiani. Thank you, Maria. On leave, 1944. They're in the Blue Grotto nightclub in Bayonne, New Jersey. Frank Sinatra exits the stage, blowing kisses after his third encore. Dad's in his army uniform, brass pips shining, smoking in old gold. He's on leave for the first time since his regiment transferred to Los Angeles. Mom snaps open a, sil a silver case with a pheasant engraved on top, a birthday gift from Dad, fishes out a quart tip cigarette. She wears a cream silk blouse with lace yoke and pearl buttons. Unable to spark a zippo, Dad leans into Mom, lights his cigarette with his. Great seats, she says. We're so close I can see Sinatra's acne scars. Dad smiles, flicks his cigarette over a glass-cut ashtray. Things any better at home, Mom asks? You didn't say in your last letter. I wanted to tell you in person, Dad says. It's not true what my sisters are claiming. Mama didn't have an accident. She threw herself out the window, but not any window, the window in my room, and she did it on the morning I shipped out to California. Mom caresses his hand. How's Papa? Dad takes a deep drag. Smoke streams out of both nostrils. My sisters have their hands full with him, drinking and sobbing how Mama abandoned him. He can never give her a break. She clung to me, didn't want me to go, Dad says, stubbing his cigarette out. What can I do? Orders are orders. Thank you. I'm going to go backwards one because I skipped Anne. Anne uh, DiVenezzi is from Mountain Lakes, New Jersey. Um, and Anne's three books of poetry are Telling, uh, Telling Abuse, Riding My Tricycle, and Grave Rubbings. Her work appears in Astavel, Av Avocet, Edison Literary Review, Italian Americana, Lips, Louisiana Literature, Patterson Literary Review, Poet Lore, Rattle, and Red River Review, among others. Um, she and her husband, Richard, live in northern New Jersey. Anne de Venezia. To be. My husband always wants me to be what he thinks I want to be. <laughs> On the day we met, he called it fate, his destiny to marry that girl. He an usher, I a bridesmaid, 
He the garter, I the bouquet. I laughed. They think I'll marry him. He's shorter than I thought my spouse would be, husky and quiet with an army crew cut. On second thought, I agreed to be his bride. Two years later, known as man and wife, what I wanted most was to be a mother. So he assured me he would do his best. <laughs> that honeymoon night in Bermuda, I cried and cried, losing my maiden name. He dried my tears and understood. I had my wish, times six, born within eight quick years. <laughs> Suddenly, from classroom teacher to nursing bras and diapers, he knew I felt unfulfilled, still wanting to be what he thought I wanted to be. Many years later, he remembered and coaxed me to be not a waitress, but a teacher once again, doing what I wanted to do. If I wanted to write for the newspaper, I could, and run for public office too. He still coaxes me to write the pa paper, paint the picture, and I do. He prods me to write a poem, and I do. He likes to hear me play the clarinet tune, and I do. He conveys to me, you can be all that you want to be.